Good Monday morning of the third week of Lent. Uh, today's, uh, actually, it's one of my favorite readings. It's from Luke's Gospel, St. Luke's Gospel. No profound insight or anything. It's just, can you rem- ever have a, remember a text that's, that somehow really kind of got to you in, in a sense that you reacted to it emotionally, and not just intellectually, but mostly emotionally? This is one of them for me. I don't know. If I was in high school, where was I? I don't, it might have even been my early years in the seminary, but I actually think it was high school. This has a high school flair to it for somebody like me, anyway. <laughs> I'm embarrassed myself here. Anyway, Jesus said to the people in the, to the people in the synagogue at Nazareth, and then I say to you, he's going to get himself in trouble here, watch him. I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native land. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was closed for three and a half years and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Zion, Sidon. So he wasn't, she wasn't a Jew. That's the kicker, okay? You got to get that, okay? She's foreign, all right? Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Again, not a Jew, you see. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of a hill of the hill. Um, uh, they led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built to hurl him down headlong. But he passed through the midst of them and went away. It's that part that got me. Tough guy. You know, they're going to throw him off. They can pick out a bottle and walk right by him. <laughs> see? I, I just, Matt, I, see, as a boy, I guess, maybe he's a teenager or whatever, I like his toughness, you know? Yeah. You think you're going to throw me over and then forget about it and do what I want? <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing profound in this one, is there, huh? But you know, I mean, not the text is, but not in my insight. Just, I see Jesus as a tough guy. It's not. But you have to know Christ. Our Lord is, you got to see it in Luke, and you got to see it in any other text in the New Testament. He doesn't, he, he goes to the cross because he chose to. It wasn't that he didn't that he couldn't stop it. He could stop anything he wanted. You see, he died voluntarily. <coughs> oh man, excuse me. I'm sorry. Got to sneeze here. You see, and I think this is an extremely important text for Luke, because Luke is writing to Greek Christians, and there was a move that they had to, that early church must have been very much struggling with these issues. So kind of. Namely, the relationship, I told you this 800 times so far. Well, how, do the, how does the non-Jewish Christian fit within the church? You, know, you see it in St. Matthew, really struggling with it. But in Luke, Luke is affirming, as it were. He's affirming that they, the Greeks, that is the non-Jew, okay, is a member of the church in full standing. You see, Christ goes to them. You see that? See? It was not, see, he's saying this is as old as our faith, as old as as Judaism and Christianity. God went to the Gentiles. (laughs) We performed the miracles with the Gentiles. I'm not saying any of this well this morning. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling. I'm stumbling, I'm sorry. But I think this is extremely important. You see? Because I think, I said this at Mass on, uh, here at St. Mark's all the time, but I'm boring them to death. I think uh, they count how many times I said it. I tell them it was 84, but it's probably twice that, more than that. And that is this. We are, I think, in the second greatest age of the church right now. Because I think that we are now, the gospel now is being proclaimed to the world. You don't have to be a you don't have to be a, a, a North Atlantic citizen. You don't have to be a European or an American to be a Christian. He whoever hears the word of God and keeps it, period. And right now we're seeing the growth of the church. It's interesting. 
all over the world as it begins to diminish dramatically in Europe and America, especially Europe. Europe has been de-Christianizing itself for centuries, and America is choosing whether it wants to be Christian or not. It's de-Christianizing itself on the political realm in terms of uh, the av advocacy for Christianity, et cetera, in any pol political forum. You can't. You can't, almost can't say anything. That's the way it starts. But what happens is you undercut it. You undercut it through education. You undercut it through all the other social instruments available to you. And before you know it, you wake up one day and it's not there anymore. You've, you've killed it indirectly. And I think of that in the public schools, especially where I went to school 50, 60, 70 years ago. Okay, I was just a boy. But we said the Our Father at, at the, the beginning of the school year, a school class, in the class, the morning class. We'd say this, the Pledge of Allegiance, plus we'd say an Our Father. You can't do that anymore for years and years, generations now, you can't. See, the, we were Jews and we were Jews and Christians, mostly Italian Catholics and Jewish, and Jews with a mixture of Protestants mixed in. But in our neighborhood, it was almost it was so intensely Italian. With sixty five percent of the population of Haven at that time was Italian. I think the rest were Jewish. Okay, and hence we we came with, with a common faith background. And you know, the teachers were often Protestant, but some were Catholics and many were Jewish. And hence, we had a common belief, a fundamental common belief in the fatherhood of God. And we prayed to that fatherhood, our father, you see. It was never a scandal. Nobody got left out. It was depoliticized. It wasn't, it wasn't political. It was fundamentally Judeo-Christian, you see. But then the courts got their nose out of joint and all that, and it was eradicated. It was eradicated. And so what we have done is we've absolutely radicalized public education, and you can't even refer to stuff. But well, you've got to be very careful how you do it, or you have to do it in distance. You treat it only as historical phenomena. It's very difficult to talk in these matters. You're saying to teach in these matters, not to teach the faith. You can't do that in a public school, obviously. But you can deal with the faith. You can deal with Christianity, Judaism, Islam. You can deal with the phenomena of social order. They're bigger than big, and yet, how do you deal with it? You have to ignore it and only present education and values solely from a secular perspective? That's catastrophic. It's, kind of, it's also vacuous. It's empty. It's not true. It's not enough. You don't have to preach Christianity or Islam or Judaism. You don't have to preach it. But how do you ever account for the social arena that we live in or the values of the nation, the values of the culture, without reference to those fundamental elements, the three great religions of the West, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? You cannot understand the evolution of the values of our civilization without direct reference to the influence that the three great Western religions had in shaping the conscience and the consciousness, the humanism of the West. You can't. You can't, you see? That's what, to me, is... I don't know how else to put it. We're betraying our own culture in a way... We, we're betraying our own culture because we're not admitting it and, a, and in a sense, acknowledging it. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. In our in educational and in our public arenas. I'm not saying anything well this morning. I'm sorry. It's just maybe I'm a little goofier than normal. But, you know, I think of this a lot. I went to public schools, and I'm grateful for my Jewish friends, my Protestant friends, the pluralism in, in, in our classroom that we were taught by Christians and Jews. It was a lot more reflective. I'll tell you the truth. It was a lot better than parochial schools, which was a ghetto. There was nothing of a ghetto in the public schools at all. And I'm so eternally grateful for that. At the same time, today, it can be described as an agnostic ghetto, not an atheist ghetto, an agnostic where it's not acknowledged. There we acknowledge all. 
70 years ago. It was a lot better than I think the Catholic schools and the parochial schools. I mean that. Now, it's the opposite.